Prefatory and Chapter 1 of English as She is Wrote. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. English as She is Wrote, Showing Curious Ways in Which the English Language May Be Made to Convey Ideas or Obscure Them. By Anonymous. Prefatory anybody said an astute lawyer addressing the jury to whom the opposing counsel had reflected upon inaccuracies in the spelling of his brief anybody can write english correctly but surely a man may be allowed to spell a word in two or three different ways if he likes this was a claim for independence of action which so commended itself to the jury that it won a verdict for his client the same plea may be considered in regard to the truly wonderful way in which the mother tongue is often written by the educated sometimes as well as by the uneducated a man it may be urged has a right to spell as he chooses and to express his ideas when he has any as best he can while when he suffers from a dearth of those rare articles he has still more reason to rejoice in liberty of choice in respect to the language he selects to cover his poverty of thought. Hence there are doubtless good and sufficient reasons for every specimen of English as she is wrote, which it is the object of this little book to rescue from oblivion, and which have, one and all, been written with the sober conviction, upon the part of the writers, that they accurately conveyed the meaning they desired intentionally humorous efforts have been carefully excluded and the interest of the collection consists in the spontaneity of expression and in the fact that it offers fair samples of the possibilities which lie hidden in the orthography and construction of our language let it be remembered then that anybody can write english as she should be wrote and hence that a certain meed of admiration is due to those who exercising their right of independent action succeed in making it at once original and racy and in conveying without the least effort meanings totally opposed to their intention affording thereby admirable examples of english as she is wrote by thousands chapter one by the inaccurate in the account of an inaugural ceremony it is asserted that quote, the procession was very fine and nearly two miles long as was also the report of dr perry the chaplain end quote. a western paper says quote, a child was run over by a wagon three years old and cross-eyed with pantalets on which never spoke afterward end quote. here is some descriptive evidence of personal peculiarities a fellow was arrested with short hair. I saw a man digging a well with a Roman nose. A house was built by a mason of brown stone. Wanted, a room by two gentlemen thirty feet long and twenty feet wide. A man from Africa called to pay his compliments, tall and dark complexioned. I perceived that it had been scoured with half an eye. A sea captain once asserted that his, quote, vessel was beautifully painted with a tall mast, end quote. In an account of travels, we are assured that, quote, a pearl was found by a sailor in a shell, end quote. A bill presented to a farmer ran thus, quote, to hanging two barn doors and myself, four shillings, six pence, end quote. A storekeeper assures his customers that, quote, the longest time and easiest terms are given by any other house in the city, end quote. Here is a curious evidence of philanthropy, quote, a wealthy gentleman will adopt a little boy with a small family, end quote. A parochial report states that, quote, the town farmhouse and almshouse have been carried on the past year to our reasonable satisfaction, especially the almshouse, at which there have been an unusual amount of sickness and three deaths, end quote. A Kansas paper thus ends a marriage notice, quote, The couple left for the east on the night train where they will reside, 
End quote. In the account of a shipwreck, we find the following, quote, The captain swam ashore. So did the chambermaid. She was insured for a large sum and loaded with pig iron. End quote. A notice at the entrance to a bridge asserts that, quote, Any person driving over this bridge in a faster pace than a walk shall, if a white person, be fined five dollars, and if a negro receive twenty-five lashes, half the penalty to be bestowed on the informer. End quote. The following notice appeared on the west end of a country meeting house. Quote, Anybody sticking bills against this church will be prosecuted according to law or any other nuisance. End quote. A gushing but ungrammatical editor says, quote, We have received a basket of fine grapes from our friend Blank, for which he will please accept our compliments, some of which are nearly one inch in diameter. End quote. On the panel under the letter receiver of the General Post Office, Dublin, these words are printed, quote, Post here letters too late for the next mail, end quote. An Ohio farmer is said to have the following warning posted conspicuously on his premises, quote, If any man's or woman's cows or oxen gets in this here oats, his or her tail will be cut off as the case may be, end quote. A lady desired to communicate by electricity to her husband in the city the size of an illuminated text which she had promised for the Sunday school room. When the order reached him, it read, quote, Unto us a child is born, nine feet long by two feet wide. End quote. A farmer who wished to enter some of his livestock at an agricultural exhibition, in the innocence of his heart, but with more truth in his words than he dreamed of, wrote to the committee saying, quote, Enter me for one jackass. End quote. An Irishman complained to his physician that, quote, he stuffed him so much with drugs that he was ill a long time after he got well, end quote. A correspondent of a New York paper described Mr. C.'s journey to Washington to attend, quote, the dying bedside of his mother, end quote. A dealer in engravings announced, quote, Scotland forever, a cavalry charge after Elizabeth Thompson Butler just published, end quote. A western paper says that, quote, a fine new schoolhouse has just been finished in that town, capable of accommodating 300 students four stories high, end quote. A coroner's verdict read thus, quote, the deceased came to his death by excessive drinking, producing apoplexy in the minds of the jury. End quote. An old edition of Morse's Geography declares that quote, Albany has four hundred dwelling houses and twenty four hundred inhabitants, all standing with their gable ends to the street. End quote. A member of a school committee writes. Quote, we have two schoolrooms sufficiently large to accommodate three hundred pupils, one above the other. End quote. A Harrisburg paper, answering a correspondent on a question of etiquette, says, quote, When a gentleman and lady are walking upon the street, the lady should walk inside of the gentleman. End quote. A clergyman writes, quote, A young woman died in my neighborhood yesterday, while I was preaching the gospel in a beastly state of intoxication. End quote. A certain friendly society, which was also a sort of mutual insurance organization, had this among its printed notices to the members, quote, In the event of your death, you are requested to bring your book, policy, and certificate at once to Mr. Blank, when your claims will have immediate attention. End quote. A New York paper describing a funeral in Jersey City says, quote, at the ferry, four friends of the deceased took possession of the carriage and followed the remains to Evergreen Cemetery, where they were quietly interred in a new lot without service or ceremony. End quote. The devotion of the friends of the deceased was certainly remarkable, but one cannot help wondering what became of the remains. A newspaper gives an account of a man who, quote, 
was driving an old ox when he became angry and kicked him, hitting his jawbone with such force as to break his leg. Quote, we have been fairly wild ever since we read the paper, writes a contemporary, to know who or which got angry at whom or what, and if the ox kicked the man's jaw with such force as to break the ox's leg or how it is, or did the man kick the ox in the jawbone with such force as to break the ox's leg, and if so, which leg? It's one of those things which no man can find out, save only the man who kicked, or was being kicked, as the case may be. End quote. One of Sir Boyle Roche's invitations to an Irish nobleman was rather equivocal. He wrote, quote, I hope, my lord, if you ever come within a mile of my house, you will stay there all night. End quote. A German tourist expresses himself in regard to his Scottish experiences as follows, quote, A person angry says today that he was from the theater gallery spit upon. Very fine. I also was spit upon. Not on the dress, but into the eye straight it came with strong force while I look up angry to the gallery. Before I come to your country, I worship the Scotland of my books, my Waverley novel, you know, but now I dwell here since six months, in all parts the picture change. I now know of the bad smell, the oath and curse of God's name, the whiskey drink, and the rudeness. You have much money here, but you want what money cannot buy, heart cultivating that makes respect for gentle things. Oh, to be spit in the eye in one half million of peopled town! Let me no longer be in this cold country, where people push in the street, blow the nose with naked finger, empty the dish at the house door, choose the clergy from the lower classes, and then go with them to death for an ecclesiastical theory which none of them can understand. I go home three days' time. End quote. There is more in this than grotesque English, however. It abounds with good sense and penetration. The following is a pattern piece of modern style, sanctioned by an English board of trade and drawn up by an eminent authority. Quote, Tickets are nipped at the barriers, and passengers admitted to the platforms will have to be delivered up to the company in event of the holders subsequently retiring from the platforms without traveling, and cannot be recognized for readmission. End quote. A college professor, describing the effect of the wind in some western forests, wrote, quote, In traveling along the road, I even sometimes found the logs bound and twisted together to such an extent that a mule couldn't climb over them, so I went round, end quote. A mayor in a university town issued the following proclamation, quote, whereas a multiplicity of dangers are often incurred by damage of outrageous accidents by fire, we whose names are undersigned have thought proper that the benefit of an engine bought by us for the better extinguishing of which, by the accidents of Almighty God, may unto us happen to make a rate together benevolence for the better propagating such useful instruments. End, quote. End of Prefatory and Chapter 1 Recording by Tricia G. Chapters 2 and 3 of English as She is Wrote by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 by Advertisers and on Signboards. Two Young Women Want Washing. Teeth Extracted with Great Pains. Babies taken and finished in ten minutes by a country photographer. Wood and coal split. Wanted, a female who has a knowledge of fitting boots of a good moral character. For sale, a handsome piano, the property of a young lady who is leaving Scotland in a walnut case with turned legs. A large Spanish blue gentleman's cloak lost in the neighborhood of the market. To be sold, a splendid gray horse, calculated for a charger, or would carry a lady with a switch tail. Wanted, a young man to take charge of horses of a religious turn of mind. 
a lady advertises her desire for a husband, quote, with a Roman nose having strong religious tendencies, end quote. Wanted, a young man to look after a horse of the Methodist persuasion. A chemist inquires, quote, Will the gentleman who left his stomach for analysis please call and get it together with the result? End quote. Wanted, an accomplished poodle nurse. Wages, five dollars a week. In the far west, a man advertises for a woman, quote, to wash, iron, and milk one or two cows. End quote. Lost, a cameo brooch representing Venus and Adonis on the Drumcondra Road about ten o'clock on a Tuesday evening. An advertiser, having made an advantageous purchase, offers for sale on very low terms, quote, six dozen of prime port wine, late the property of a gentleman forty years of age, full of body, and with a high bouquet, end quote. A steamboat captain, in advertising for an excursion, closes thus, quote, Tickets twenty-five cents, children half price, to be had at the captain's office, end quote. Among carriages to be disposed of, mention is made of, quote, A male phaeton, the property of a gentleman with a movable head as good as new, end quote. An inducement to return property is offered as follows, quote, if the gentleman who keeps the shoe store with a red head will return the umbrella of a young lady with whalebone ribs and an iron handle to the slate-roofed grocer's shop, he will hear of something to his advantage, as the same as a gift of a deceased mother, now no more with the name engraved upon it. End quote. An English matrimonial advertisement reads as follows, quote, A young man about twenty-five years of age, in a very good trade, whose father will make him worth one thousand pounds, would willingly embrace a suitable match. He has been brought up a dissenter with his parents, and is a sober man. End quote. A landlady, innocent of grammatical knowledge, advertises that she has, quote, a fine, airy, well-furnished bedroom for a gentleman twelve feet square, end quote. Another has, quote, a cheap and desirable suit of rooms for a respectable family in good repair, end quote. Still another has, quote, a hall bedroom for a single woman eight by twelve, end quote. A photographer's sign reads, quote, this style three pictures finished in fifteen minutes while you wait for twenty-five cents beautifully colored, end quote. A cheap restaurant displays this sign, Oyster pies open all night, and coffee and cakes off the griddle. A baker displays the sign, family baking done here. The sign would look more appropriate if it were in front of some of our, quote, cool and well-ventilated summer resort hotels. The sign at Abraham Lowe's Inn, Douglas, Isle of Man, is accompanied by this quaint verse, quote, I'm Abraham Lowe, and halfway up the hill, if I were higher up, what's funnier still, I should be low. Come in and take your fill of porter, ale, wine, spirits, what you will. Step in, my friend, I pray no further go, my prices, like myself, are always low. End quote. On a vacant lot back of Covington, Kentucky, is posted this sign, quote, no plain base bowl on these primacies. End quote. Notice in a Hoboken ferry boat quote, The seats in this cabin are reserved for ladies. Gentlemen are requested not to occupy them until the ladies are seated. End quote. A sign in a Pennsylvania town reads as follows quote, John Smith, teacher of cotillions and other dances, grammar taught in the neatest manner. Fresh salt heron on draft, likewise good phrase cordial, roots sausage and other garden truck, N.B. ball on Friday night, prayer meetin' Tuesday, also psalm singing by the choir. End quote. The following notice appeared on a fence of a vacant lot in Brooklyn. Quote, All persons are forbidden to throw ashes on this lot under penalty of the law or any other garbage, end quote. 
a barber's sign in Buffalo, New York, has the following. This is the place for a physiognomical hair-cutting and ecstatic shaving and shampooing. A San Francisco bootblack of poetic aspirations proclaims his superior skill in the following lines pasted over the door of his establishment. No day was e'er so bright, so black was never a night, as will your boots be if you get them blackened right in here, you bet. The following appears on a Welsh shoemaker's signboard. Price die as cobbler, dealer in bacco shag and pigtail bacon and giner bread, eggs laid by me, and very good paradise in the summer, gentleman and lady can have good tay and crumpets and strawberry with a skim milk, because I can't get no cream. N.B. Shoes and boots mended very well. An Irish inn exhibits the following in large type. Within this hive we're all alive with whiskey sweet as honey. If you are dry, step in and try, but don't forget your money. An inn near London displays a board with the following inscription. Call, softly. Drink, moderately. Pay, honorably. Be good company. Part friendly. Go home, quietly. Let these lines be no man's sorrow. Pay today, and I'll trust tomorrow. Chapter 3. For Epitaphs a terse account of an untimely end is given upon a stone in a Mexican churchyard. He was young, he was fair, but the Injuns raised his hair. The following may be read upon the tombstone of Lottie Merrill, the young huntress of Wayne County, Pennsylvania. Lottie Merrill lays here she didn't know what it was to be afeard, but she has had her last tussle with the bars, and they've scooped her, and she was a good girl, and she is now in heaven. It took six big bars to get away with her. She was only eighteen years old. Upon the tomb of a boy who died of eating too much fruit, this quaint epitaph conveys a moral. Currents have checked the current of my blood, and berries brought me to be buried here. Pears have pared off my body's hardihood, and plums and plumbers spare not one so spare. Fain would I fain my fall, so fair a fair, lessons not hate, yet tis a lesson good. Guilt will not long hide guilt, such thin washed wear wears quickly, and its rude touch soon is rude. Grave on my grave some sentence grave and terse, that lies not as it lies upon my clay, but in gentle strain of unstrained verse, prays all to pity a poor Patty's prey, rehearses I was fruitful to my hearse, tells that my days are told, and soon I'm told away. In Glasgow Cathedral is an epitaph which is engraved on the lid of a very old sarcophagus, discovered in the crypt. Our life's a flying shadow, God's the pole, the index pointing at him is our soul. Death's the horizon where our sun is set, which will through Christ a resurrection get. In a graveyard at Montrose in Scotland, this inscription may still be seen. Here lies the body of George Young and of all his posterity for fifty years backwards. This brief announcement may be read in Wrexham Churchyard, Wales. Here lies five babies and children dear, three at Austri and two here. In a churchyard near London, the following may be deciphered. Killed by an omnibus? Why not? So quick a death a boon is, let not his friends lament his lot, for mors omnibus communis. There is an unqualified Hiberianism in the following. Here lies the remains of Thomas Maelstrom, who died in Philadelphia March 17th. Had he lived, he would have been buried here. A good deal of positive information is conveyed in this epitaph. Here lies, cut down like unripe fruit, the wife of Deacon Amos Shute. She died of drinking too much coffee, Annie Domini, 1840. To the Victim of an Accident here lies the body of James Hambrick, 
which was accidentally shot in the Pecos River by a young man with one of Colt's large revolvers with no stopper for the hand for to rest on. It was one of the old-fashioned sort, brass-mounted, and of such is the kingdom of heaven. William Curtis, who was famous for his bad grammar, may have composed his own epitaph. Here lies William Curtis, our late Lord Mayor, who has left this world and gone to that there. In a churchyard in London, evidently written by a cockney. Here lies John Ross, kicked by a hoss. In Trinity Churchyard, New York, this inscription may be read. Val blank. Sidney Breeze, June 9, 17 something. Made by himself. Ha, Sidney, Sidney, liest thou here? I lie here till time's last extremity. Upon a stone under the grocer's arms is this inscription, in memory of Gerard, a tea dealer. Garrett, some called him, but that was too lie. His name was Gerard, who now here doth lie. Weep not for him, since he is gone before, to heaven where grocers there are many more. The value of phonetic spelling is set forth in this terse memorial. Here lies two brothers by misfortune surrounded, one died of his wounds, the other was drowned. Resignation and an eye to the main chance are combined in the following. Beneath this stone, in hope of Zion, doth lie the landlord of the lion, his son keeps in the business still, resigned unto the heavenly will. In the churchyard in Wiltshire, England, Beneath this stone lies our dear child, who's gone away from we for evermore into eternity, when we do hope that we shall go to he, but him can never come back to we. On Mrs. Sarah Newman Pain was my portion, physic was my food, groans was my devotion, drugs done me no good. Christ was my physician, knew what way was best, to ease me of my pain, he took my soul to rest. An inscription to four wives. To the memory of my four wives, who all died within the space of ten years, but more particular to the last Mrs. Sally Horn, who has left me and four dear children. She was a good, sober, and clean soul, and may I soon go to her. Dear wives, if you and I shall all go to heaven, the Lord be blessed, for then we shall be even. William Joy Horn, Carpenter Anna Dyer He died to live, and lived to die. On Mrs. Lee and her son In her life she did her best, now I hope her soul's at rest. Also her son Tom lies at her feet, he lived till he made both ends meet. At Edinburgh John McPherson was a wonderful person. He stood six feet two without his shoe, and he was slew at Waterloo. One John Round was lost at sea, and in the graveyard of his native place a stone was erected with the following couplet inscribed thereon. Under this bed lies John Round, who was lost at sea and never found. In an old churchyard in Ireland, here lies John Hiley, whose father and mother were drowned on their passage to America. Had they lived, they would have been buried here. In a churchyard in Ohio. Under this sod and under these trees lieth the bod E of Solomon Pease. He's not in this hole, but only his pod. He shelled out his soul and went up to his God. From a tombstone in Cornwall, England. Father and mother and I lie buried here asunder. Father and mother lie buried here, and I lie buried yonder. On Eliza Newman. Like a tender rose tree was my spouse to me. Her offspring plucked, too long deprived of life was she. Three went before. Her life went with the six. I stay with three, our sorrows for to mix, till Christ our only hope, our joys doth fix. On a drummer in an English churchyard. 
Tom Clark was a drummer who went to the war and was killed by a bullet and his soul sent for. There were no friends to mourn him, for his virtues were rare. He died like a man and like a Christian bear. On a Stone Near Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia Robert C. Wright was born June 26, 1772, died July 2, 1815, by the bloodthirsty hand of John Sweeney Sr., who was massacred with the knife, then a London gun discharge a ball penetrate the heart that give the immortal wound. At Middletown, Connecticut, is the following. This lovely, pleasant child, he was our only one, although we've buried three before, two daughters and a son. The controlling power of rhyme is well illustrated in the subjoined from a tombstone in Manchester. Here lies, alas, more's the pity, all that remains of Nicholas New City. N.B. His name was Newtown. Another instance of how rhyming difficulties may be overcome is as follows. Here lies the remains of Thomas Woodhen, the most amiable of husbands and excellent of men. N.B. His real name was Woodcock, but it wouldn't come in rhyme, his widow. The subjoined contains a solemn warning. My wife has left me, she's gone up on high, she was thoughtful while dying, and said, Tom, don't cry. She was a great beauty, so every one knows, with hebe-like features and a fine Roman nose. She played the piano and was learning a ballad, when she sickened and died did from eating veal salad. Upon a tombstone in Pennsylvania. Battle of Shiloh, April 6, 1862. John D. L. was born March 26, 1839, in the town of West Dresden, state of New York, where the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are at rest. A tombstone in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, has these lines. When you, my friends, are passing by, and this inform you where I lie, remember you ere long must have, like me, a mansion in the grave, also three infants, two sons and a daughter. End of chapters 2 and 3 Recording by Tricia G. Chapters 4 and 5 of English as She is Wrote by Anonymous this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 By Correspondence From a Butcher at Burhampur, India, to a Customer To His Highness, Kid Esquire, The humble butcher, now's Roney, Respectfully showeth that for your honor Has sent a good beef, one rump, And pleased to take it, And pay day labor of bearer coolly as your obedient butcher shall ever pray. From a scholar in India to his master. My dear sir, I humbly beg to inform you, please, to give me leaf for one week, because I cannot walk with my feet, I am very uncomfortable. Give my compliments to my master. I pray to God for everlasting life. I am your humble servant, Shabart Lal. From an Indian schoolboy. Benevolent sir, the wolf of sickness has laid hold on the flock of my health. From an Indian clerk. Sir, being afflicted to the stomach and vomit ang, I am sorry I cannot attend to office today. From a Canadian lady to an eligible gentleman. Dear Mr. B., I, Mrs. Wigston, wish you would call on my daughter Amelia. She is very amusing and is a regular young flirt. She can sing like a honeybee, and her papa can play on the fiddle nicely, and we might have a rare hoe-down. Amelia is highly educated. She can dance like a grasshopper looking for grub, and she can make beautiful bread. It tastes just like honeybee's bread, and for pumpkin pies she can't be beat. In fact, she's ahead of all F girls, and will make a good wife for any man. Yours truly, Mrs. Wigston. Bring your brother. From a schoolboy to the elder Booth. West House School, Prospect, New York. Dear Sir and Friend. 
hearing that you was going to come to Utica to perform in a play called Hamlet, I would like to say that us boys is getting up a exhibition for the benefit of diseased soldiers and their widows and orphans, and would like to engage you to do the leading part. I have talked it up with the boys, and we will do the squire thing by you, and I am arterized to make you the following offer. We will come down after you with a good conveyance, and will give you at the rate of ten dollars a day and board, and shall want you one week. If you think it necessary, you can have one or two of our best women actors to come up with you, but we can't pay them over three dollars a day and feed. You can have some fun at a hunting deer and foxes around Flamberg's and Ed Wilkison's. Please let me know as soon as you can. Yours truly, James Sweet. If you come callating to hunt, get Frank Meyer's hound, she is a good one. We subjoined several letters received by a New York publishing house. Blank, Louisiana, November 18, 1880-something. Dear Sir, I have seated myself down to pen you a few lines in regards off your high de Grode text books. Sir, I wish you would forward to me in the next mail a catalogue off all of your educational old and latest published books in market. I stand in need off a good set of books, and when I receive your catalogue, I will send on immediately and get a selectest outfit of your books. By so doing, you will oblige yours, and etc. Dear S.R., I saw a small list of yours embraces standard works in every department of study and for every grade of classes from the primary school to the university, I desire to have correspondence with you, and as I taught school for through three season in the ninth district of Fuentress County, Tennessee, and I quit Imet with Cooper, and our country need instruction, and except we get the implement for instruction, we may always expect ignorant. Turn over. Mister, I want you to send educational list of your standard works, and also a copy book, that I may instruct my studentes more correctly, and I proffer to take agents if it is not contrary to law if your work can sold without paying tax or leason. And a blige yours truly, Joel E. Atkinson, school teacher, 9 District, Fuentress Co., Logan Finch, Charles Atkinson J. Hall, E. School Directors in my district days. Dear Sir, I want you to send me a catalogue, the emblem book, and tell me what it will cost. I think I can sell as many as fifteen, be sure, and give the price that is what they want to know. Dear Sir, I received your copy October ninth, 1881. If you charge anything for composing them letters, write to me and I will pay. We'll send it by mail in one cent stamps. You need not to think I want to swindle you out of one cent. I will do everything I say I will do. So if you will write and give the price of the emblem and the love writer and chart and key of the Spencerian system and they like, I will get up a subscription and send the money for them immediately. Dear sir, tell me what is the emblem of a red rose and a white rose of a boca. Dear sir, Wilt please send me a description of your outfit of books and give me one or two I dies about the catalogue price of your English, Latin, Greek, French, and Spanish, Italian, Hebrew, and Syriac books to my address. I has issued out orders, bought commission, etc. My trustee tell me that only two DVZ, and in New York at the time, it Febby, the fifteen. My no of books is twenty-five, and I desire one complete example of your best books. If you can convene furnish my needs right at once, I will be more an obliged to you. Looking by every mail for your returns soon, so please your truly servant. I am, dear sir, my name in full, blank. Dear sir, Understanding that you possess some influence among the board of directors of your fine books and for useful learning for schools, I beg to solicit your interest for me. I want to purchase some useful books and messers 
please send me one of your catalogues, you will oblig thee much in so doing, and far my friends I will tell you I have a great many of relatives who would wish to purchase some book if could be bought from you below price. My friend, you must excuse my hasty note for the small time was at hand, and also my friend, you must excuse my lead pencil. Write my soon friend, I will close and will show you that you will be remembered by sirs, your obedient and faithful servants, blank. Sir, I now write to you to ask you information on book lines, sir. I have seen some of your books, and the suited me very much on educational, and, sir, I did suspect to start to teach school in the same ward, and I wanted to get a fennel resortment of of books, and I wanted to get my books from you, and I wanted like to know how you would reply me them, and I hope when you received this letter that you would write right away, at once, and give me the full address how to send for these books, and I want to know whether I give you the right address, sir, your friend blank, would like to read a letter from under your hand, and I want you to please to give me your address of all kinds of books that you have. I expect to start school soon, and I had much applications by pupils that lives a rounds in the sections where I lives, says if I gets the books, they would buy them from me, I hope that you would write as soon as possible, and let me know so I can write again, and please to send me some of your paper, so that I can read them to the people, so them can believe that I did wrote here. When you write, please to direct your letter to blank, so I hope you will write soon, and please fail not to send me some of your papers, and direct me how to get money to you, when I send for books, fail not to direct your letter to blank post office. So I have no more to write. I will close and remain your truly friend. M. Alabama October 13, 1881 Dear sir, dear friend, will you please send me one line of capitals letters, one line of the small letters, and show me the space how far up and how far down and write and tell me what the chart and fray with cost. The chart of the standard system is the one I want. There is eight men I have shown your copy you sent to me. They say they intend to have one chart apiece. Dear sir, I have been talking with several young men about love writers. I want you to compose three letters consisting of love and poetry. Write one as though you loved her and want to marry her. One as though she had slighted you. The next one, as you think best compose them, and send them to me, and I will show them to the boys, I am satisfied they will be sure to buy. Letter to an Editor Dear Sir, The historic apple that tossed about and struck Sir Isaac Newton landed finally, in revealing its inner nature its hidden meaning, not only as a consolation, but also of universal utility in all scientific granges or out of the symbols of the ancient world up to the real discoveries of the present time preceded the solution of the relation of the eternal time, motion, and distance, which set forte the discovery of the generational cosmological parents of this planet, are discovered that these can be seen by all mankind. Resp. Letter received by a cotton broker. Flat Town, December 30th. Messrs. J. W. and Company, Sir, Gentlemen, The shipments from this out the balance of the season will be for more on the count. Last year was a short crop, and two weeks early than this season, and people sold right straight along here last season, and the biggest and best farmers this season are holding looking forward to bigger prices. I have gathered eighty bales, and fifteen or sixteen more in the field yet to pick, so you see when I make my estimate in this county, they are a power of cotton on the fields yet to pick, and a great eel in houses not gined up yet. Just act as if those deals were your own, should you close them out, just credit my account with the profits, but don't close them out until you think it has touch bottom, then I want you to buy me the same amount, but don't buy till you think it the right time, and then should you see a profit in it, 
turn it loose without ever consulting me if it clears up cold we will have killin frost but it can't hurt here for the crop is made i remain yours very truly another letter to a cotton broker misters w w and company sir gents i have gust got in form the west and find your letter stating that corn had touched bottom which i do think myself it has but it has advanced so much now i don't know that it would pay me much either way now had i been at home i should have closed out and of bout the same amount was my id we are from ten days to fully two weeks backwards with our crops owing to our wet weather but that don't say they won't be as much made as was last year while we are backward there are more fertilizers used than where last year and more acreage our country is in a better condition to make a crop and i expect the west generally that way at the same time i am only one neighborhood please let me hear from you more fully on the matter hoping to hear from you soon i remain yours very truly I will act according to your counsel. A Georgia merchant received a short time since the following order from a customer. Mr. B., please send me one dollar worth of coffee and one dollar worth of sugar, some small nails. My wife had a baby last night, also two padlocks and a monkey wrench. Chapter 5. By the Effusive Professor Huxley is credited with the assertion that the primrose is, quote, a coral of floral dicotyl donus exogen with a monopetalous corolla and a central placenta, end quote. A reporter with a large imagination, writing about the decoration of a church at a fashionable wedding in this city, said that, quote, the church was ensconced in flowers, end quote. A scientific writer defines sneezing as, quote, a phenomenon provoked either by an excitation brought to bear on the nasal membrane or by a sudden shock of the sun's rays on the membranes of the eye. This peripheral irritation is transmitted by the trifacial nerve to the gasserian ganglion, whence it passes by a commissure to an agglomeration of globules in the mandula oblongata or in the protuberance. From this point, by a series of numerous reflex and complicated acts, it is transformed by the mediation of the spinal cord into a centrifugal excitation which radiates outward by means of the spinal nerves to the expiratory muscles. End quote. The school committee in Massachusetts recommend exercises in English composition in these terms. Quote, Next to the pleasure that pervades the corridors of the soul when it is entranced by the wiling witchery that presides over it, consequent upon the almost divine productions of Mozart, Haydn, and Handel, whether these are executed by magician concert parts in deep and highly matured melody from artistic modulated intonations of the finely cultured human voice, or played by some fairy-fingered musician upon the trembling strings of the harp or piano, comes the charming delight we experience from the mastery of English prose, and the spellbinding wizards of song, who by their art of divination through their magic wand, the pen, have transformed scenes hitherto unknown, and made them as immortal as those spots of the Orient, and mountain haunts of the gods, whether of sunny Italy, or of tuneful, heroic Greece." End quote. A farmer's daughter expresses herself in the following terms. Dear Miss, the energy of the race prompts me to assure you that my request is forbidden, the idea of which I awkwardly nourished, notwithstanding my propensity to reserve. Mr. T. will be there. Let me with confidence assure you that him and brothers will be very happy to meet you and brothers. Us girls cannot go for reasons. The attention of cows claims our assistance this evening. Unalterably yours. The following is probably the longest sentence ever written, containing, as it does, eight hundred words. I propose, then, to give your readers some description of this old yet still strange and wild country that has been settled for three hundred years and is not yet inhabited, 
a land of shifting sand and deep mud, a land of noble rivers that rise in swamps and consist merely of chains of shallow lakes, some of them twenty miles long and two miles across and only twelve feet deep, of wide, sandy plains covered with solemn-sounding pines, of spots so barren that nothing can be made to grow upon them, and yet with a soil so fertile that if you tickle it with a hoe, it will laugh out an abundant harvest of sugar, cotton, and fruit, a land of oranges, lemons, pomegranates, pineapples, figs, and bananas, whose rivers teem with fish, its forests with game, and its very air with fowl, where everything will grow except apples and wheat, where everything can be found except ice, yet where the people, with a productive soil, a mild climate, and beautiful nature, affording every table luxury, live on corn grist, sweet potatoes, and molasses, where men possessing forty thousand head of cattle never saw a glass of milk in their lives, using the imported article when used at all, and then calling it consecrated milk where the very effort to milk a cow would probably scare her to death, as well as frighten a whole neighborhood by the unheard-of phenomenon, where cabbages grow on the tops of trees, and you may dig bread out of the ground, where below the frost line the castor oil plant becomes a large tree of several years' growth, and a pumpkin or bean vine will take root from its trailing branches, and thus spread and live year after year, where cattle do not know what hay is, and refuse it when offered, so that the purchase of a yoke of oxen is not considered valid if the animals will not eat in a stable, and where in the mild winter, when the land grass is dried up, horses and cattle may be seen wading and swimming in the ponds and streams, plunging their heads under water grasses and moss, where many lakes have holes in the bottom and underground communication, so that they will sometimes shrink away to a mere cupful, leaving many square miles of surface uncovered, and then again fill up from below and spread out over their former area, where some of them have outlets in the ocean far from shore, bursting up a perpetual spring of fresh water in the very midst of the briny saltness of the sea, where in times of low water, during a long exhaustive dry season, men have gone underground in one of these subterranean rivers from lake to lake, a distance of eight miles, where the ground will sometimes sink and the cavity fill with water until tall trees that had stood and sunk upright will have their topmost branches deeply covered, where rivers will disappear in the earth and rise again, thus forming natural bridges, some of them a mile in breadth, where instead of spring, summer, autumn, and winter, there are two seasons only, eight months summer and four months warm weather, where the winter is the dry season, and the summer almost a daily rain, where, in order to take a walk, you first wade through a light sand ankle deep, and then get into a mud puddle, and some of these mud puddles cover a whole county, where no clay is found fit for brick making, and people build houses without chimneys, where to make a living is so easy a task, that every one possesses the laziness of ten ordinary men, Every one you wish to employ in labor says he is tired, and would seem to have been born so, where ague would prevail if the people would take the trouble to shake, where a large orange tree will bear several thousand oranges, leaves, buds, blossom, half-grown and full-grown fruit all at once, and every twenty-five feet square of sand will sustain such a tree, where in many parts cold weather is an impossibility, and perpetual verdure reigns, where the everglades are found, covering many large counties with water from one to six feet deep, with a bottom mud-covered, yet underneath solid and firm, from which grasses grow up to the surface, a sea of green, and with islands large and small scattered over the surface, covered with live oaks and dense vegetation, where alligators, or gators as they are called in Florida parlance, possess undoubted aboriginal rights of citizenship, and mosquitoes pay constant visits and are instructive and even penetrating in their attention to strangers. An Irish paper contained this account of Mrs. Siddons' appearance. On Sunday, Mrs. Siddons, about whom all the world has been talking, exposed her beautiful, adamantine, soft and lovely person, 
for the first time at Smock Alley Theatre in the bewitching, melting, and all-tearful character of Isabella. From the repeated panegyrics of the impartial London newspapers, we were taught to expect the sight of a heavenly angel, but how were we supernaturally surprised into almost awful joy at beholding a mortal goddess? The house was crowded with hundreds more than it could hold, with thousands of admiring spectators who went away without a sight. This extraordinary phenomenon of tragic excellence, this star of Melpomene, this comet of the stage, this sun of the firmament of the muses, this moon of blank verse, this queen and princess of tears, this Donellan of the poisoned dagger, this empress of pistol and dagger, this chaos of Shakespeare, this world of weeping clouds, this Juno commanding aspects, this terpsichore of the curtains and scenes, this proserpine of fire and excitement, this caterfelto of wonders, exceeded expectation, went beyond belief and soared above all the natural powers of description. She was nature itself. She was the most exquisite work of art. She was the very daisy, primrose, tuberose, sweetbriar, furze blossom, gilliflower, wallflower, cauliflower, auricula, and rosemary. In short, she was the bouquet of Parnassus. When expectations were so high, it was thought she would be injured by her appearance, but it was the audience who were injured. Several fainted before the curtain drew up. When she came to the scene of parting with her wedding ring, ah, what a sight was there! The very fiddlers in the orchestra, albeit unused to melting mood, blubbered like hungry children crying for their bread and butter. And when the bell rang for music between the acts, the tears ran from the bassoon player's eyes in such plentiful showers that they choked the finger stops, and making a spout of the instrument, poured in such torrents on the first fiddler's book that not seeing the overture was in two sharps, the leader of the band played it in one flat. But the sobs and sighs of the groaning audience and the noise of corks drawn from smelling bottles prevented the mistakes between sharps and flats being heard. One hundred and nine ladies fainted. Forty-six went into fits, and ninety-five had strong hysterics. The world will scarcely credit the truth when they are told that fourteen children, five old men, one hundred tailors, and six common councilmen were actually drowned in the inundation of tears that flowed from the galleries, the slips, and the boxes to increase the briny pond in the pit. The water was three feet deep. An act of Parliament will certainly be passed against her playing any more. Few poems have been more generally admired or paraphrased in the various tongues of earth than that commencing with the lines, Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, this lamb was sure to go. The story is current at the national capital that Mr. Evarts, when Secretary of State, on one occasion in a jocular crowd of his friends, was desired to condense into prose these immortal verses. Urgently solicited, Mr. Evarts yielded and wrote as follows. Mary, a female, judged to be of the race of man, whose family name is unknown, whether of native or foreign birth, of lofty or lowly lineage, and whose appearance, manners, and mental cultivation are involved in the most profound mystery, which probably will never be fully ascertained unless through the most profound researches of an historian admirably trained in his profession, who shall devote the ablest efforts of his life to the investigation of the subject, uninfluenced by either passion or prejudice, and having only in view the sacred truth, at the same time being utterly regardless of the plaudits or censures of the world, we are informed by one who, it has been stated, at one time while living in that part of the United States of America known as Massachusetts, whose fishermen have frequently been involved in difficulties with the authorities of Her Majesty Queen Victoria, Queen of Great Britain and Empress of the Indies, whose domains extended over a large share of the habitable globe, thereby endangering the peace which should so happily exist between nations of the same blood and language, had an infant sheep, 
of which there are many millions of various stocks and qualities now in our country, constantly adding wealth and prosperity to our republic, and enabling us to be entirely independent of all other nations for our supply of wool, now ample for the use of factories already busily employed, and for those which ere long will be constructed in all parts of our land, working both by water and steam power, and in whatever direction the said Mary travelled, this animal, whose fleece was snow white, even as the lofty mountain regions in the silent solitudes of eternal winter, as the ethereal vapours which oft float over an autumnal sky, darkly, deeply, beautifully blue, or as the lacteal fluid, covered with masses of delicate froth, found in the buckets of the rosy dairy-maid, whether meandering through the meadows in midsummer, gathering the luscious strawberry, strolling in the woodland paths in search of wild flowers, visiting the church with her uncles, cousins, and aunts, to listen to the inspired words which come from the lips of the minister of the sanctuary, or when retiring to her blissful couch to seek rest and enjoy sweet repose after the cares and labors of the day, in fact, everywhere that Mary went, this youthful sheep, influenced doubtless by that affection which is oft so conspicuously manifested by the lower animals in their association with human beings, was ever observed to accompany her. End of chapters 4 and 5 Recording by Tricia G. Chapters 6 and 7 of English as She is Wrote by Anonymous this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6. How She Can Be Oddly Wrote The following amusing rhyme, clipped from an old paper, shows to advantage some of the peculiarities of the English language. Sally Salter Sally Salter, she was a young teacher that taught, and her friend Charlie Church was a preacher who prot, though his friends all declared him a screecher who scrot. His heart, when he saw her, kept sinking and sunk, and his eyes meeting hers kept winking and wunk, while she in her turn fell to thinking and thunk. He hastened to woo her, and sweetly he wooed, for his love for her grew, to a mountain it grew, and what he was longing to do, then he dooed. In secret he wanted to speak, and he spoke to seek with his lips what his heart had long soak. So he managed to let the truth leak, and it loke. He asked her to ride to the church, and they rode, they so sweetly did glide, that they both thought they glowed, and they came to the place to be tied, and were towed. Then, homeward, he said, let us drive, and they drove, as soon as they wished to arrive, they arrove for whatever he couldn't contrive, she controlled. The kiss he was dying to steal, then he stole, at the feet where he wanted to kneel, there he knoll, and he said, I feel better than ever I fall. So they to each other kept clinging and clung, while time his swift circuit was winging and wung, and this was the thing he was bringing and brung. The man Sally wanted to catch, and had caught, that she wanted from others to snatch, and had snot, was the one that she now liked to scratch, and she scrot. And Charlie's warm love began freezing and froze, while he took to teasing, and cruelly toes, the girl he had wished to be squeezing, and squoze. Wretch, he cried, when she threatened to leave him and left, how could you deceive me as you have decept? And she answered, I promised to cleave, and I've cleft. Plotting Changes Some of our plotting readers may like to peruse the following curious variations of the well-known line from Gray's Elegy, The Plowman Homeward Plods His Weary Way. The weary plowman homeward plods his way. The weary plowman plods his homeward way. The homeward plowman plods his weary way. The homeward plowman, weary, plods his way. The homeward, weary, plowman plods his way. The weary, homeward plowman plods his way. Homeward, the weary plowman plods his way. 
Homeward, weary, the plowman plods his way. Homeward, the plowman plods his weary way. Homeward, the plowman, weary, plods his way. Weary, the homeward plowman plods his way. Weary, homeward the plowman plods his way. Weary, the plowman plods his homeward way. The plowman plods his homeward weary way. The plowman plods his weary homeward way. The plowman homeward weary plods his way. The plowman weary homeward plods his way. The plowman weary plods his homeward way. My Madeline, my Madeline, mark my melodious midnight moans. Much may my melting music mean my modulated monotones. My mandolin's mild minstrelsy, my mental music magazine, my mouth, my mind, my memory, must mingling murmur Madeline. Muster mid midnight masquerades, mark Moorish maidens, matrons mean. Mongst Mercia's most majestic maids, match me my matchless Madeline. Mankind's malevolence may make much melancholy music mine. Many my motives may mistake, my modest merits much malign. My Madeline's most mirthful mood much mollifies my mind's machine. My mournfulness's magnitude melts makes me merry madeline matchmaking ma's may machinate maneuvering misses me misween mere money may make many mate my magic motto's madeline melt most mellifluous melody midst mercia's misty mounts marine meet me by moonlight marry me madonna mia madeline it is well known that the letter E is used more than any other letter in the English alphabet. Each of the following verses contains every letter of the alphabet except the letter E. A jovial swain should not complain of any buxom fair who mocks his pain and thinks it gain to quiz his awkward air. Quixotic boys who look for joys, quixotic hazards run. Alas, a noise with trivial toys, opposing man for fun. A jovial swain may rack his brain, and tax his fancy's might. To quiz is vain, for tis most plain, that what I say is right. Northampton, England Courier Here is the result of a rhyming punster's efforts. A pretty deer is dear to me, a hare with downy hair, a heart I love with all my heart, but barely bear a bear. Tis plain that no one takes a plane to pair a pair of pears, although a rake may take a rake to tear away the tears. Souls raise, raise time, time raises all, and through the whole holes wears. A scribe in writing right may write to write and still be wrong, for right and right are neither right, and don't to right belong. Robertson is not Robert's son, nor did he rob Bert's son, yet Robert's son is Robin's son, and everybody's son. Beer often brings a beer to man, coughing a coffin brings, and too much ale will make us ail, as well as other things. The person lies who says he lies when he is not reclining and when consumptive folks decline, they all decline declining. Quails do not quail before a storm, a bow will bow before it. We cannot rain the rain at all, no earthly power reigns o'er it. The dyer dies a while, then dies, to die he's always trying, until upon his dying bed he thinks no more of dying. A son of Mars mars many a son, all days must have their days, and every night should pray each night to him who weighs his ways. Tis meet that man should meet out meat to feed one's fortune's son. The fair should fare on love alone, else one cannot be won. Alas, alas, is sometimes false. Of faults a maid is made. Her waist is but a barren waste, though stayed she is not stayed. The springs shoot forth each spring, and shoots, shoot forward one and all. 
Though summer kills the flowers, it leaves the leaves to fall in fall. I would a story here commence, but you might think it stale, so we'll suppose that we have reached the tail end of our tale. And here is a zoological romance by C. F. Adams, inspired by an unusual flow of animal spirits. No sweeter girl you ever knew than Betty Martin's daughter Sue, with sable hair, small taper waist, and lips you'd go for miles to taste. Bright lambent eyes, like the gazelle, sheep pertly brought to bear so well, ape pretty lass it was avowed, of whom her marmot to be proud. Dear girl, I loved her as my life, and vowed to heifer for my wife. Alas, a sailor on the sly had cast on her his weather eye. He said my love for her was bosh, and my affection I must squash. He'd dog her footsteps everywhere, and eat her in the easy chair. He'd set her round, this sailor chap, and point her out upon the map, where once a pirate cruiser bore him captive to a foreign shore. A cruel captain far outdid the yaks and crimes of Robert Kidd. He oft would wail Jack with the cat, and say, My buck, do you like that? What makes you stag around so, say? The cat amounts to something, eh? Then he would seal it with an oath, and say, You are a lazy sloth. I'll starve you down, my sailor fine, until for beef and porcupine. And, fairly hoarse with fiendish laughter, would say, Henceforth, mind what giraffe-der. In short, the many risks he ran might well a llama braver man. When he was wrecked in castor shore, while feebly clinging to a gnaw, hyena cleft among the rocks, he crept sans shoes and minus ox. And when he fain would go to bed, he had to lie in leaves instead. Then Sue would say with troubled face, How could you live in such a place? And straight away into tears would melt, and say, How badger must have felt? While he, the brute, would chuck her chin, and say, Ay, ay, my lass, and grin. Excuse these steers, it's over now, there's not like grief the heart can cow. Jack asked her to be his, and she, she gave jackal and jilted me. And now, alas, the little minx is bound to him with hymen's links. Detroit Free Press While upon the subject of puns, we might quote the following clipped from the graphic. On being consulted about it, Spikes says that Uncle Sam anticipates the transfer of the Indian Bureau to some mother department, and if this should father improve the condition of the children of the forest in sundry ways, by cousin them to be more comfortable, it would be a niece arrangement and daughter be made. End quote. We are inclined, in nephew instances, to agree with the grandma, but not the spelling. The graphic is also responsible for the following English stanza transformed into Russian, said to have been found in a room after it had been vacated by Alexis while in this country. It is introduced as an example of how she can be oddly wrote. O what a jolly time I've ad, since he took a leave of me old dad. O what a merry cove I've been, I've spent a nawful pile of tin. Dam sorry to live me now, but landed Goshen jingo vow. The tour Kishwar must have a stop. Go tell Grapitoff to pop. The following clever paraphrase of the old rhythmic story of Jack's house is a good illustration of the scope and flexibility of our language, and suggests the fact that tautological errors of writing need seldom be committed. Behold the mansion reared by Dadal Jack. See the malt stored in many a plethoric sack, in the proud cirque of Ivan's Biuvac. Mark how the rat's felonious fangs invade the golden stores in John's pavilion laid. Anon, with velvet foot and Tarquin strides, 
subtle grimalkin to his quarry glides grimalkin grim that slew the fierce rodent whose tooth insidious johann's sackcloth rent lo now the deep-mouthed canine foe's assault that vexed the avenger of the stolen malt stored in the hallowed precincts of that hall that rose complete at jack's creative call here stalks the impetuous cow with crumpled horn whereon the exacerbating hound was torn who bade the feline slaughter beast that slew the rat predaceous whose keen fangs ran through the textile fibres that involved the grain that lie in hands's inviolate domain here walks forlorn the damsel crowned with rue black tiferous spoils from vaccine dugs who drew of that corniculate beast whose torturous horn tossed to the clouds in fierce vindictive scorn the harrowing hound whose braggart bark and stir arched the lithe spine and reared the indignant fur of puss that with verminicidal claw struck the weird rat in whose insatiate maw lay reeking malt that erst in ivan's courts we saw robed in senescent garb that seems in sooth too long a prey to chrono's iron tooth behold the man whose amorous lips incline full with young eros's osculative sign to the lorn maiden whose lacked albic hands drew albu lactic wealth from lacteal glands of that immortal bovine by whose horn distort to realm ethereal was born the beast catullian vexer of that sly ulysses quadrupedal who made die the old mordacious rat that dared devour antecedaneous ale in john's domestic bower lo here with hirsute honours doffed succinct of saponaceous locks the priest who linked in hymen's golden bands the torn unthrift whose means exiguous stared from many a rift even as he kissed the virgin all forlorn who milked the cow with implicated horn who in fine wrath the canine torturer skied that dared to vex the insidious muricide who let the auroral affluence through the pelt of the sly rat that robbed the palace jack had built the loud cantankerous shanghai comes at last whose shouts aroused the shorn ecclesiast who sealed the vows of hymen's sacrament to him who robed in garments indigent exosculcates the damsel lachrymose the emulgator of that horned brute morose that tossed the dog that worried the cat that kilt the rat that ate the malt that lay in the house that jack built chapter seven by the untutored care should be taken in writing for the young or they may get a wholly different meaning from the language than that intended the bishop of hereford was examining a school class one day and among other things asked what an average was several boys pleaded ignorance but one at last replied it is what a hen lays on this answer puzzled the bishop not a little but the boy persisted in it stating that he had read it in his little book of facts he was then told to bring the little book and in doing so he pointed triumphantly to a paragraph commencing the domestic hen lays on an average fifty eggs each year if english is wrote as she is often spoke by the ignorant and careless she would bear little resemblance to the original queen's english a listener wrote out a short conversation heard the other day between two pupils of a high school and here is the phonetic result where'd yer go last night had her skate jer find thice hard and good yes hard nuff jer go er lone no bill and joe went er long how late jer stay past eight let me know when yer go again won't yer i want ter go and show yer how ter skate hm if i couldn't skate better'n you i'd sell out and quit well we'll try er and can see if yer can here as they took different streets their conversation ceased a writer in the schoolboy magazine has gathered together the following dictionary words as defined by certain small people bedtime shut eye time dust mud with the juice squeezed out fan a thing to brush warm off with 
Fins. A fish's wings. Ice. Water that stayed out in the cold and went to sleep. Monkey. A very small boy with a tail. Nest egg. The egg that the old hen measures by to make new ones. Pig. A hog's little boy. Salt. What makes your potato taste bad when you don't put any on? Snoring. Letting off sleep. Stars. The moon's eggs. Wakefulness. Eyes all the time coming unbuttoned. The following specimens from scholars' examinations in making sentences to illustrate the definitions of words found in their small dictionaries will have a familiar sound to some of our readers. Frantic. Wild. I picked a bouquet of frantic flowers. Retorted. Returned. We retorted home at six o'clock. Summoned. Called. I summoned to see Mary last week. Athletic. Strong. The vinegar was too athletic to be used. Poignant. Sharp. My knife is very poignant. Ordinances. Rules. We learned the ordinances for finding the greatest common divisor. Turbid. Muddy. The road was so turbid that we stuck fast in the mud. Tandem. One behind another. The scholars sit tandem in school. Akimbo. With a crook. I saw a dog with an akimbo in his tail. Atonement. Satisfaction. There is no atonement in boat riding in a cold day. Composure. Calmness. The composure of the day was remarkable. We have the authority of the late Dr. Hart as to the genuineness of the following extracts taken from the papers of a class seeking admission into a high school, to which had been given a list of words for their meanings and applications. Fabulous. Full of threads. Silk is fabulous. Accession. The act of eating a great deal. John got very sick after dinner by accession. Atonement. A small insect. Queen Mab was pulled by atonements. Develop, to swallow up. God sent a whale to develop Jonah. Circumference, distance through the middle. Distance around the middle of the outside. Mobility, belonging to the people. The mobility of St. Louis has greatly increased. Adequate, a land animal. An elephant is an adequate. Gregarious, pertaining to idols. The Sandwich Islanders are gregarious. Fluctuation, coming in great numbers. There was a great fluctuation of immigrants. Alternate, not turnate. Intrinsic, not trinsic, weak, feeble. He was a very intrinsic old man. Subservient, one opposed to the upholding of servants. End of chapters 6 and 7. End of English as she is wrote by Anonymous.